Hello everyone, class is very much in session. My name is Jack from Colorholics.com and it's time to take a look at Monday Night Raw from Seattle, Washington, right up in the northwest of the United States of America. And very importantly, this was my birthday edition of Monday Night Raw. That's right, Raw was on October 1st and I had a lovely birthday. So let's take a look without any further ado at Graded and find out if Raw put on a tip top show for your boy's birthday. Let's, let's see if they did. Let's see if they did. So we kick things off uh, in wise fashion, I believe, with, yes, it was a talking segment, but it was an interview in the ring with Dean Ambrose, the man with all of the question marks flying around him after last week on Raw, when the heels tried to tempt him away from the shield, but he appeared to stick with the shield last week, albeit in uneasy fashion. In the interview, Ambrose kind of teased the fact that, you know what, he's Dean Ambrose, he's a lunatic, he's unpredictable, maybe he <laughs> drove Roman Reigns' car off the road on the way to the arena, the venue, and that Roman isn't gonna turn up at all. That got a cheer, obviously, because fans are heartless. But in the end, Dean was just sort of messing about and said, you know what, the Shield are my brothers, and I'm with them. I'm ride or die with the Shield, and that's that. And then Baron Corbin came out to stir up a little bit of trouble, he did. Corbin, in sort of Teddy Long fashion, offered, he didn't do the dance very sadly, but he sort of offered Dean Ambrose three choices. He said, listen to me, and I will grant you these choices three. Choice the first, Dean. You can have an Intercontinental Championship match with Seth Rollins. Choice the second. You can have a Universal Championship match with Roman Reigns. Or choice the third. You can go one-on-one -on -one with Braun Strowman. And I was obviously thinking, go for one of the title matches, Dean. Come on, stir things up. Dean sort of avoided the question, which was really clever, because we don't know what he's thinking. And he said, you know what? How about I just go one-on-one -on -one with you right now, Baron Corbin? And Corbin went, right, well, you know what? I'll just pick, I'll just pick for you. You can go one-on-one -on -one with Strowman right now. Now, yes, this was an opening segment, and it wasn't the most exciting exciting thing in the world, but I thought every single thing in it made absolute perfect sense. Also, Dean was great on the microphone. He's very consistently charismatic. He's always a great promo guy. And I enjoy Baron Corbin's devilish little choices. So I'm going to give this an A-, minus. although despite the lack of, you know, action or shock, it was still a strong opening to Monday Night Raw. Then straight away we had the match between Ambrose and Braun Strowman and it went exactly how you'd expect that sort of match to go. Strowman dominated at first because of his size and strength but then Ambrose bravely in a babyface way fought his way back into the match. But I liked it because it wasn't in the overly wacky way that he used to back in the day. Now that we've got short hair Dean Ambrose and bigger arms Dean Ambrose, <laughs> Dean Ambrose large arms edition, it really sort of worked because Ambrose was fighting back but not in a, not in a silly way. He was just being a bit of a badass. Strowman then eventually managed to hit the running power slam and then didn't go for the pinfall. He dragged Dean Ambrose back up by his hair to deal out more punishment. But before he could, Roman Reigns ran out and punched him. Big Superman punch to Braun Strowman for the DQ victory for Big Braun. Then Rollins also came out and the pair helped fight off Braun Strowman and save Dean Ambrose. But afterwards, in a nice little backstage segment, Ambrose was furious at Seth Rollins and said, look, I didn't need help, the match wasn't over. Yes, he hit me with the power slam, but I'm Dean Ambrose. And you know what? And this was brilliant. This was a really good line. He went, and you know what as well, Seth? I could be an Intercontinental Champion right now. Not just implying that he could have taken the match with Rollins, but also saying, you know what? I would have beaten you as well. I'm gonna give this a B plus. It wasn't the most spectacular match. It was pretty basic, but at the same time, it really made sense. I was very frustrated by Roman Reigns running in before the match was even over but it made total sense in terms of the storyline because if he'd run in to sort of save Dean Ambrose from a beatdown after the match, then that would have been totally justified. But the fact that Roman is overstepping his mark and really trying to save Dean Ambrose, even though he didn't necessarily need help yet, I think that's very in character for Roman Reigns. You know, I'm the big dog, I'm, I'm the strong one, I can do what I want. And Ambrose's frustration afterwards was very compelling. So a B plus, I thought this was pretty damn exciting. So a great start to my birthday edition of Monday Night Raw. Then Baron Corbin came out and went, right, you know what, Roman Reigns, you're going one-on-one -on -one with Dolph Ziggler right now. But, and this confused me, and I don't know if I just missed a little detail about why it happened or not, but this was originally going to be for the Universal Championship, and then Corbin went, whoa, 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 whoa. This is a non-title match. Let's just get that clear right now. So this was really strange because Ziggler didn't even look particularly pissed off at that. I mean, I'd be really annoyed if I was, you know, rob robbed of a title shot, a title opportunity, sorry, we're speaking, we're in WWE land here, we need to use words like that. But um, this was a really good match, to be fair. Roman Reigns and Dolph Ziggler appear to have a really good chemistry together. There were a lot of near falls, for example, Ziggler rolled up, Roman at one point held a hold of the tights, but then Reigns kicked out and stuff like that. It was really good. Ziggler um, almost got the win on several occasions, but eventually he got caught with a big spear. Roman Reigns picked up the victory and would have retained his title if it was a title match, but because it was non-title, 
nothing really changed. He just beat Dolph Ziggler as we'd expect him to. I'm going to also give this a B plus. It was a better match than Ambrose versus Strowman, but the booking of Ambrose versus Strowman was far better than this one because I spent a lot of the match thinking, why has Corbin made it non-title? If I had a hazard a guess, again, if I haven't missed a little detail somewhere, I'd guess it's because Corbin wants to keep those titles on the two members of the Shield to keep on fostering a bit of resentment between Ambrose and the other two boys. But at the same time, why was Ziggler not annoyed? I mean, I'd be really annoyed if I had a universal title shot and then it was taken away from me. So... It gets a B plus because it was a stronger match, but the booking was a bit more confusing to me. Next up, we had Ronda Rousey accompanied by her best friends, the Bella Twins, and Ruby Riot accompanied by the Riot Squad. Really good to see Liv Morgan straight away back on television the next week. She wasn't in a match, admittedly, but it's good to see that she's not suffering any long-term damage as a result of her kick to the skull last week. This match was a decent one. It reminded me of Ronda Rousey versus Alexa Bliss at the last pay-per-view because they needed to think of excuses for Ruby Riot to get in a lot of offense on someone as strong and imposing as Ronda Rousey. And they did so. She used similar tactics to Alexa Bliss. For example, she went after Rousey's sore ribs. She also used the help of Liv Morgan and Sarah Logan on the outside. She had her stalemates, causing little distractions, little pieces of interference to help her really gain a foothold in a match where she should have realistically been squashed immediately. So it all made quite a lot of sense. And I like that. In the end, Ronda Rousey won, and I'm gonna give this a B. I was gonna give it a slightly lower grade, but I'm giving it a bit of a higher one, just because I think that Ronda Rousey is displaying incredibly good instinct as a pro wrestler, despite her lack of experience compared to just about everyone else on the roster. Uh, her shirt got a little bit torn at one point during the match, but rather than just get rid of it or ignore it, she waited until her babyface comeback towards the end of the bout, and then ripped it off, like in a Hulk Hogan way, which kind of really got the crowd behind her. So I think that the fact that she waited to do that kind of like how Angle would wait until a key moment to pull the straps down or whatever, shows really good timing and really good instinct on her part. I was really, really impressed by that. So Raw got off to a really, really strong start, but then the second hour sort of just kind of went downhill a little bit. And this was the first match to really start that decline. It was Bobby Roode versus Connor from The Ascension. This was a pretty short match. Basically what happened was Bobby Roode lost because Chad Gable was like doing some kind of pose or taunt on the apron or firing the crowd up going, come on, I'm Chad Gable, I'm Bobby Roode's tag partner and I couldn't be happier about it. And then Victor came and just cracked him in the back and Chad Gable flew off the apron. Bobby Roode was obviously like, what the hell is going on? Why is my friend hurt? And then Connor rolled him up for the one, two, three. I'm gonna give this, a wait, I've just remembered that the finish was not a roll up. It was actually Connor's finisher, which I don't know the name of because it's Connor's finisher, but it looked a little bit dangerous actually. I was quite scared for Bobby Roode. Thankfully he seemed to be fine, but he got absolutely carted into the air from Connor. I'm gonna give this match a C minus anyway. The reason for this is because the match was kind of slow and, and you know, it was short, but it was, it wasn't that inspiring a wrestling match. But at the same time, I totally understand Bobby Roode's reason for losing the whole Chad Gable distraction thing. But I just want this storyline to really accelerate. I'm sick of us being bogged down week after week with just Chad Gable kind of annoying Bobby Roode in little ways and eventually one of them's gonna turn heel. I just wanna get the heel turn out of the way and then the pair of them can feud properly. But instead, we've got this, elongated feud with the Ascension of all people. And it's nice to see the Ascension, you know, get opportunities that they wouldn't normally get, but they shouldn't be beating Bobby Roode or Chad Gable. Far, far more established superstars than them, really. Next up, oh, maybe my least favorite part of the show. We had the B team versus the Revival, a feud that I honestly thought was over now that the Raw Tag Team Championships are elsewhere. They're on Ziggler and McIntyre. And the Revival put on such a good performance last week against Ziggler and McIntyre, and I honestly thought that they would get a little boost because of that. And then the B team go and beat them. It was immensely frustrating to see this. I, I like the B team, don't get me wrong, but I like the Revival a lot more. And I just don't understand why they would lose clean to the B team so soon after such a heroic babyface performance last week against Ziggler and McIntyre. So the B team won clean and beat the Revival, but then the B team were jumped by the Authors of Pain and the Authors of Pain really beat them down and maybe this is gonna start a new feud. Maybe the B team are gonna have some time off because of that. I really don't understand what's going on. But overall, I'm gonna give this segment a D minus. I found it really, really frustrating. Next up, we had Seth Rollins versus Drew McIntyre. But before the match, the three heels, Strowman, Ziggler, and Drew, all met backstage and Strowman went, right, Drew, you really, really gotta beat Seth Rollins here. We can't be having another weak link in the team. And then he stared at Dolph Ziggler and Ziggler was like, gulp. Because the other two lads are much bigger than him, obviously. Yeah, it was fine, it was fine. This match was pretty good. We already know that Seth Rollins and Drew McIntyre have really good chemistry. In fact, Drew and just about anyone has really good chemistry. Drew is a real asset 
to WWE right now. I mean, he was having great matches with Dean Ambrose quite recently, another great match against Seth Rollins, but one that suffered a lot because of a very predictable finish, thanks to that little pre-match segment featuring the three heels. Basically, towards the end of the match, Rollins looked to be picking up steam, and then Dolph Ziggler ran out, caused the distraction, and this allowed Drew McIntyre to pick up the victory. Mm. It was okay. Again, this was a non-title match, so Drew McIntyre doesn't win the IC title, but it was good for what it was until the finish. I really didn't like the finish because I just because I knew it was coming so far in advance. That's not me bragging, by the way. Like, if you have seen Raw, I'm sure you saw it coming as well. If you didn't see Raw, you probably would have seen it coming just because it was telegraphed so much by that opening little pre-match segment. So I really struggled to grade this segment. Um, I was really torn because I really enjoyed the match. I thought it was pretty, pretty decent for what it was. It wasn't the longest match, but it really, really suffered because of that finish. I think I'm going to settle somewhere on a B minus. Not the most inspiring part of the show, but certainly not the worst thing on the show either. Next up, oh my goodness, Kevin Owens and Elias who came out. And this was my favorite part of the show, I think. It just goes to show that there's nothing more enjoyable sometimes in wrestling than two heels just classic segment just two heels getting as much heat as they can from a passionate crowd this was wonderful now i'll break this down for you if you don't understand basketball because thankfully i am a bit of a low-key sneaky nba fan and used to play a bit of basketball in my youth believe it or not despite being five foot ten it was tricky once everyone else hit puberty too and you know yeah no offense to anyone beneath five foot ten i'm with you we're all short kings together you know i'm a bit of an average king but you, I've got your back, is what I'm saying. Basically, KO and Elias said, there's no way we're going to lose to John Cena and Bobby Lashley in Australia. That is ridiculous. Almost as ridiculous an idea as the city of Seattle having a basketball team. Because Seattle used to have a basketball team, the Sonics, and then they moved away to Oklahoma. They're now the Oklahoma City Thunder. And the heat was immense. The crowd were booing constantly. It reminded me of when a great indie wrestler like Zach Gibson or somebody, there's a wrestler on the UK indie scene. He's also part of NXT UK called Zach Gibson, who is a master at getting heat from the crowd. And they boo throughout his promos to the point where you can't really hear him. The crowd were this loud for Kevin Owens and Elias. They were booing so loudly that Owens and Elias had to shout into their microphones and you still couldn't really hear them properly. It was hilarious. You could tell that both guys were having a whale of a time. They were trying hard not to laugh themselves. I think it was really classic heel work and it was executed wonderfully well. Then, you know, Leo Rush came out and defended Lashley and Cena and said, you know what, Cena's a legend. He's the greatest of all time and everyone knows this and that got a bit more of a boo. But because of how effective heels KO and Elias were, kind of got you on Leo Rush's side so you kind of had to agree with what he was saying. It was masterful work from KO and Elias here. And then Bobby Lashley came out and there was about to be a match. But I'm going to grade this segment on its own merit because it was wonderful. I'm giving it an A. I was going to give it an A+. Plus. Leo Rush his bit at the end took a bit of the sheen off it but that was the heel promo of the year from KO and Elias watch it on YouTube it was hilarious the crowd were wonderful for booing them so much it was just brilliant I loved it as for the match itself well I was a little bit annoyed here kind of slow kind of clunky stuff between Kevin Owens and Bobby Lashley and then the finish was what we've basically seen for the past few weeks nothing really changed basically what happened was Elias grabbed Leo Rush on the outside Leo Rush instead of fighting him off because he's a wrestler was because he's a two or five live guy tried to escape him and use his weird little parkour skills to scuttle through his legs and stuff didn't really work Elias kind of kept hold of him and uh, Lashley was distracted enough that Owens managed to roll him up and secure a sneaky sneaky victory then the heels beat them both down afterwards and everyone booed some more this was nowhere near as good as the promo segment beforehand in fact I'm gonna give it a D um, I just don't like the idea that Leo Rush can't fend for himself. He should at least be able to put up a fight. Yes, he's a smaller guy, but in being bested or trying to escape every time someone lays their hands on him, it's not only burying him, it's burying the entirety of the 205 Live roster, which includes Cedric Alexander, one of the most badass lads in WWE today. Mustafa Ali, one of the most uh, consistent superstars in WWE today. Buddy Murphy, one of the most improved and now impressive. And also my boy Lince Dorado too. Big ups, Lince. Big ups to you, sir. Next up, we had Bailey versus Alicia Fox with Finn Balor in Bailey's corner and Jinder Mahal in Alicia Fox's corner. It was okay. It was another hype segment, basically, for the Mixed Match Challenge. It was, it was a match too, but it was basically hype for the Mixed Match Challenge. The match was okay. Alicia Fox is not one of the more consistent wrestlers. Sometimes when she's on her game, she can actually really surprise everyone and be quite good. But sadly, this was not one of those days. She did hit her wonderful Northern Lights suplex, which is genuinely one of the best in the world. But at the same time, she was making a few little sloppy mistakes here and there. Uh, Bailey secured the win with the Bailey to Belly suplex, but it was the way in which she secured that win. Uh, basically, Bailey hit 
the ropes, Jinder grabbed her leg to stop her from hitting Alicia Fox with a move of some sort, and then Finn Balor came around the outside of the ring, Bailey kicked Jinder backwards, and he was hit with a sling blade from Balor. The timing on that was really good, but at the same time, it wasn't the most inspiring of matches. It was essentially just hype for the mixed match challenge, which is nice to see, but it's sad to see two such talented superstars as Finn Balor and Bailey so low in the pecking order on Monday Night Raw currently. So this gets a C minus. Nothing really wrong here, but it wasn't the best thing on the card by quite a stretch. And finally, we had the obligatory hype segment for the whole Triple H Undertaker feud, which is rumored to be heading into a Big Brothers of Destruction versus DX feud, which is now rumored to be leading to some sort of singles match for Shawn Michaels. But we don't know how much of that's true. So let's just look at this as it was. So big Shawnee M hit the ring and basically said, you know what? I've gotten into a bit of trouble recently for picking Triple H over The Undertaker, but I would not pick anybody over my best friend on God's Green Earth. And I was like, fair play, Sean, sticking by your boy, that's all good. Then Kane's music hit, and I was like, the mayor of Knox County, Tennessee, or is it Knoxville County? It's one of the two. The mayor of a county in Tennessee is here to play for the first time in ages. Sign me up right now. Kane didn't come out of the entranceway. He was magically behind Shawn Michaels. Michaels had no idea. Turned round into a big uppercut. I still don't think anyone in the game really does an uppercut as well as Kane. He's one of the best of all time at uppercuts. They're so good. Michaels sold it perfectly. Great to see a classic Shawn Michaels bump for the first time in a while. And then the gong hit. Suddenly Undertaker used his magical teleportation power to get into the ring and the pair were about to do really nasty things to Shawnee M. But then Triple H came out, but he made a mistake here. He should have come out to uh, time to play the game, you know, his big badass, it's time to wrestle theme tune. But he came out to his corporate, it's time to do business theme tune, the King of Kings, which means that he's not as effective in the ring when he uses that theme music doesn't hype him up as much, and he was wearing a suit. So Triple H ran down, tried to fend off the Brothers of Destruction, but it was too much. Kane and Undertaker won the battle against DX, and then as they were gonna leave the ring, they thought, no, not enough damage has been done yet, brother. And then Undertaker got back in the ring, hit Shawn Michaels with the tombstone, and that was the end of Monday Night Raw. Bit of a strange end in this. I honestly wasn't too big a fan of it. It was really exciting to see all these old, really over superstar names in the ring at the same time. But at the same time, I thought putting them on last with no prior build throughout the rest of the show kind of meant that, oh yeah, none of these other roster members are as important as these old semi-retired guys. And I found that pretty sad. Because of that, I'm, I'm gonna give this either a C plus or a B minus. I, just for the electricity of the crowd, I'll give it a B minus, but I wasn't honestly too impressed with it. Um, also, shockingly, when Shawn Michaels' hat fell off, he shaved his hair off. I was shocked. And they didn't mention it on commentary or anything. It was just there for us all to see. And I was like, that's crazy. Shawn Michaels, the sexy boy with his long 80s locks, which he wore well into the 90s and 2000s, and no more. He's now sexy dad, sexy grizzled, stone cold looking Shawn Michaels. Bit of a shock, but I guess, I guess it's all right. I, I, don't, I don't care that much. I'm sure Ross has a lot to say about it on WTF Moments. Make sure to check that out. But yeah, this gets a B minus. Uh, so it's time to give my overall thoughts on Monday Night Raw. So I don't really know what to give Raw because the first hour was really, really strong and then a lot of the rest of the show was really inconsistent. And then I think that was all kind of summed up by just chucking all the veterans out at the end to do their thing. And it all felt a bit like it was meant to overshadow the rest of Raw. I really enjoyed the ongoing S.H.I.E.L.D. storyline or most of it with Dean Ambrose, but on the whole, I wasn't too impressed with Raw. Not too impressed. There was a lot of frustrating stuff going on here. I think the action, though, was generally quite good, so I'm going to give it a B-. minus. Pretty good wrestling, for the most part. Inconsistent booking and storytelling. So, for my birthday, WWE did all right. They gave me an all right Raw, and that means that I'm, I'm probably going to have an all right year of my life, because my birthday's got off to an all right start. Thanks very much, WWE, and thank you very much, as well, for watching this episode of Graded. I've been Jack from cultaholic.com. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you want to jack the job, you can follow all of us at Cultaholic generally. And if you want to as well, check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And never forget, of course, if you haven't already, to hit that subscribe button and to join us.